Welcome to the Italian Renaissance Podcast, where we discuss essential topics about the art and culture of 15th and 16th century Italy. I'm your host, Lawrence Cinangeli. Andiamo avanti. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second episode of the Italian Renaissance Podcast. My name is Lawrence Cinangeli. I'm your host. Obviously, we've decided to come back for a second episode, which is really exciting. When you when you start something like this, a f- first episode tends to be a trial. Is this something that, that that is good quality, good content, and something that you're capable of doing? And I, I think I've landed that this is a, a worthwhile endeavor for me, for you guys, and to buffer the, the, the presence of art and history in the podcast world. There's one really big caveat to my last episode that I'd like to go over before we move forward here today, and that is that if you were to take my words exclusively from the last episode, you would think that the Renaissance was a period only dominated by men, right? Ingenious men who who changed the world. But the reality of the situation is that current scholarship, mine included, is looking to help further elaborate on the role of women in the Renaissance. There were female painters. I can think of Palatila Nelli in Florence. There were female politicians, though more so behind the scenes, such as Lucrezia Tornabuoni, the mother of Lorenzo the Magnificent, who essentially was a key factor in in maintaining the diplomacy and financial supervision of the Medici Bank when when Lorenzo couldn't or, or wouldn't, essentially. There's also someone like the famous Vittoria Colonna, platonic lover of Michelangelo, who was a phenomenal poet in her own right. So it's it's really important that we're not forgetting the women, but also that we're elevating them and that we're considering their effects in producing what is the cultural entity of the Renaissance. However, it is the grim reality that the social atmosphere of the Renaissance period, what we call the Renaissance period, and even what's the late Middle Ages and into the Baroque and well into the modern era, um, is a, a male-dominated world. So that the, the presence of women is more behind the scenes or counterculture, but still genius and still important. This isn't to say, hey, let's throw our women a bone here, okay? To resist culture is something that the Renaissance almost did. In a a sort of way, we can imagine thinkers of the time rejecting their current modes of existence and wanting to to reimagine it, or in in their case, to to look back to something, um, even though they ended up inventing an entirely different concept. It is the subsequent history that further pressed our current knowledge of the involvement of women. So what we're trying to do is effectively reverse that, not to invent a new history that involves women, but to see history as it is, as it happened, which was undoubtedly with the great efforts of both men and women, not solely men. And on that note, I have to say that that is the current efforts of scholarship of this period, in addition to many other things. But because of that, it's going to be difficult for me to always include a variety of of voices on the subjects that we're talking about, because it is still a male-dominant field. So this is a work in progress, and one that I think the following decades will see effectively worked out. And now that you know that I'm not a misogynist, <laughs> I'm going to ask, um, in that I do plan now to to really push forward with, with coming out with podcasts for your study purposes, for your lazy days, for whatever reason you may be listening, um, that I do ask for whatever mode that you're listening to please give me a rating. If you think I'm garbage, that's okay too. But if you could give me a positive rating so that I can get this information out and so that I can make this project grow because it's something that I think is important. So I appreciate all of your listens, your likes, your ratings, and everything else moving forward from here on. I thank you very much. So let's talk about the episode, the fundamentals of Renaissance painting. 
This is a difficult one, I have to admit, because it changes so much and that there is no real consistent rules. Um, but a series of spread out innovations in pictorial composition, in use of color, in use of style, in line, in material, in medium, um, and even the way that art is produced and the role of the patron and artist changes during these really critical periods. You guys are gonna learn a little bit of Italian today, okay? Remember, I was an Italian instructor, but also to talk about the Italian Renaissance, you have to know the terminology in Italian because we use those words when discussing Italian Renaissance art in English, okay? So the first one, and probably the least important one that, I, that I'll teach you is the Trecento. Trecento, this means the, the 1300s, right? So if we're talking about things that lead into the Renaissance, pre-Renaissance, proto-Renaissance, Dante, Giotto, we're going to be talking about art and, and literature of the Trecento, right? That literally means the word 300, but it's the 1300s. Don't ask me why. More important is the Quattrocento, Quattrocento, the 400s, the 14. Hundreds, the period that we know as as the 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 early Renaissance, or the Renaissance, the Quattrocento. So I might refer to Quattrocento painting, such as Botticelli and Da Vinci, right? Or Cinquecento. The Cinquecento, the Cinquecento is five hundreds, fifteen hundreds. When you get a lot of your works like Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel and artist from that period, but re really I, I tend to talk about the Quattrocento more. That is the immediate focus of a great deal of what we're doing. Raphael is a, is a Cinquecento artist. We'll talk about Raphael a little bit too. So we've got Trecento, 1300s, Quattrocento, 1400s, Cinquecento, 1500s, okay? From the Trecento through the Quattrocento, a lot of of Italy is divided, even through the Cinquecento, into comune or communes, right? Republics and, and these sorts of sorts of entities that have what is known as a guild society. These guild societies are city-states, their communes are led more or less by guild members, guild leaders. And we're, we talk about a lot about Florence, and Florence is what we would call a mercantile state. It is run and driven by its commercial presence. So the guilds are essentially important in the fabric of, of Florentine society and principally responsible for the commission of, of art. In this period, actually, the word arte in Italian means guild right? The, the Arte de Lana, the, the wool guild, who, who was essential in a lot of commissions. Or the Calimala is, is responsible for all of the decoration of the Florence Cathedral Santa Maria del Fiore. A result of this is that artists are in competition to get commissioned work by guilds, so that they are trying to be innovative, trying to start to gain a sort of notoriety in the sense that we may modernly understand artists, but that wasn't quite the same idea um, in the, the end of the Trecento and into the Quattrocento. We're still not doing art for art's sake. We're, art is craft. It is like building, it is like construction. So that um, the idea of creating something beautiful, it, it's more important to to create something innovative that the guilds are going to return to you for patronage, right? For, for commission so that you can eat. In that vein, the guild decides a great deal of what the artist is creating. The artist is not coming up with the subject matter, isn't even in a lot of times coming up with the materials used. The money is going to sometimes be fronted by the guild, sometimes the artist has to come up with it themselves, and they essentially write contracts between them, the patron, and the artist. That is going to get into very specific detail as to what the artist should be doing. I have a book here 
by Michael Baxendall, a very important text called Painting and Experience in 15th Century Italy, that is the Quattrocento, where he provides a translation of one of these contracts between the prior of the Spedali degli Innocenti, that is the um, orphanage in Florence, and the very famous Domenico Ghirlandaio, a painter who um, Michelangelo would follow in terms of style and technique, right? So I'm going to read some of this to you so you can understand the language of some of these contracts and how they sounded and how specific the patron could be. He says in this written contract that was signed by both of them, um, this is Messer Francesco di Giovanni Tesori, like I said, the prior of the Spedale, the, ho the hospital, uh, okay? That this day, the 23rd of October of 1485, the said Francesco commits and entrust that the said Domenico, the painting of a panel which the said Francesco has had made and has provided. Okay, guys, so Francesco is providing the panel for Domenico Ghirlandaio. The which panel, the said Domenico, is to make good, that is, pay for, and he is to color and paint the said panel all with his own hand in the manner shown in the drawing on paper with those figures and in that manner shown in it. That means there's already a drawing here, guys. There's already a cartoon drawn up and that he has to paint specifically in exactly that with his own hand. No workshop attendance, no help. And he must color the panel at his own expense with good colors and with powdered gold on such ornaments as demand it, and with any other expense incurred on the same panel. And the blue must be ultramarine of the value about four florins the ounce. Ultramarine blue is the most expensive color at this period. So much so that Francesco specified the quality of blue and the cost of blue that Ghirlandaio must put forward to paint this panel for them before receiving payment, okay? And that if Domenico has not delivered the panel within the above said period of time, he will be liable to the penalty of 15 large florins. Ghirlandaio does not get to navigate away from these terms. He's contracted to them. He'll have to use his skill technique and innovation to create a picture that is pleasant to look at, okay? Um, the painting in question here, for your own reference, you can look it up, is the Adoration of the Magi, finished in 1488. It is in the Spedali degli Innocenti in Florence, and that's by artist Domenico Ghirlandaio, okay? It's a hard one to spell. Let the Google filler finish that one for you. This opens us up to the conversation about medium. What are painters painting on? What are they using and how? Primarily, what you're going to find in this period are rarely canvas. Canvas gets painted on in the late Quattrocento and definitely into the Cinquecento and the, the Seicento, the 1600s. You're looking like it's at a panel. It's going to be a wood panel from the contract. So you have tempura painting. That is the mixing of pigment with egg yolks to make their 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 colors more vibrant. Tempura, not the delicious Japanese deep frying technique, okay, but the mixing of, of egg yolk with pigment. So tempura on wood is a really, really common type of painting. And you also have fresco. We talked about fresco a bit in the first episode. There's two types of fresco. There's fresco secco, dry fresco, right? Painting directly onto a wall. And then there's fresco. Then the word means f fresh, right? And why it's it, it, it's called that is because what you're taking is fresh plaster, you're putting it onto the wall itself wet, and you're adding your pigment to the wet plaster so that the painting becomes the wall. Oftentimes you can see each day that a fresco is worked on by looking at the drying and the plaster because it can dry slightly differently or there can be lines or different slight changes in the color. And this is called a giornata. In Italian, giornata means a day. If you tell someone like buona giornata, you tell them have a nice day. So in art, giornata refers to a day spent on a 
true fresco applying wet plaster and how much can an artist complete in a day. We can track that and see how long a fresco cycle took to paint. Often an artist is going to work on wood panels in his bottega, workshop, the bottega, with assistants. But you may say that they, he may take his bottega, he may take his, his workshop, his assistants to a location to paint frescoes. And oftentimes uh, a series of frescoes completed by an artist is actually uh, maybe just his drawing and the workshop does the, does the rest or the workshop uh, and assistants help finish it, especially major projects like enormous palatial rooms that need entirely frescoed are going to use the artist plus assistants. So it's a lot of times you can't expect a, a fresco cycle to be, be solely a famous artist hand. Now, in addition to fresco and wood panel painting, artists like Botticelli, like um, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, and, and artists of their time are going to do some canvas painting, and that usually involves oil paints, which you see developed in Venice. Venetian painting is particularly occupied with color-based, um, dynamic, vibrant composition. And I'm going to say more on color here towards the end when we get into the four modes of, of color composition in Renaissance painting. But I'd first like to talk about uh, Leon Battista Alberti. In 1435, Alberti came out with his treatise on painting that we call it in English, Della Pittura in Italian. We talked about Renaissance humanism and Alberti was certainly a humanist, architect, writer, philosopher, philologist, grammarian. Um, and this treatise he had originally written in Latin, as we spoke about in the first episode, but also in the Volgare, the vernacular language. He wanted this accessible. So we, we've got two versions, a Latin version and a vernacular version. Um, and he was a strong force in the popularization of, of the vernacular, but in any case, this work introduces the importance of linear perspective, uh, how the painter is to properly create perspective and depth, which he expanded uh, from the works of Filippo Brunelleschi, a really essential architect that we'll talk about in future episodes. To kind of drill in this, this humanist idea of, of, of Alberti, we, he referred to figures in painting um, uh, as their expression should ex should show movements of the soul in dire direct relation to movements of the body in the expressions of figures. This is that Neoplatonic concept, the idea of mental movements that the body and face should reflect the inner workings of the mind and soul. I'm trying not to ramble as I bring this all together, but what is the essential takeaway? What did Alberti do in the most basic level was introduce linear perspective. And a lot of times in a lot of Renaissance art, you can see they physically paint the grid, either in the, in the architecture, in the floor design that Albert, Alberti sets the stage to do. I was lucky enough to do a workshop on Alberti in perspective, to actually try to recreate it. It's not easy. It is a highly technical skill. Now we, we take it bare bones and we do vanishing points and this sort of thing with basic, with basic uh, art for, for people who like to doodle. But to, to actually create a substantial work with accurate and uh, detailed perspective that draws you into the painting, mind you, the Renaissance is reintroducing this from an art form in the Middle Ages that wasn't concerned with it. Alberti provides the tools for that, that almost every successful artist is going to follow. And beyond Alberti and beyond perspective, I do recommend if you're interested in a deep dive, you actually read his treatise on painting because it is substantial to understanding the, the workings of the Italian painter. But the painter must then employ what we would call optical compensation to their work. That is, they have to paint it in a way that it is understandable from the position that it is going to be in. So if you know it's going to be an altarpiece, like the Ghirlandaio altarpiece, and that it's going to be higher up, 
Ghirlandaio would have to paint that in a way that it would look normal from down below. We see this with sculpture with Michelangelo's David that was meant for one of the apses of the, the, the cathedral in Florence, where people often complain, well, why is this head so big? Because you were going to look at it from below, so the head needed to be bigger so that it was optically compensated. It's the same reason when we're looking at paintings and textbooks, and when we get to them, we see them with our own eyes in the position that they're supposed to be in, and they just look different and better because you're not supposed to take photos of them head on. You're supposed to view them from the side or from below or from above or from wh wherever they intend to be and from wherever you're meant to view them. Artists are conscious of this. They're conscious of perspective. They're conscious of optical compensation, viewpoints. This is an essential factor in understanding the composition of a Renaissance painting. The Renaissance artist is conscious of composition in how the eye is drawn across a painting. And they're often designed in a way that they are readable in some sort of order and some sort of progression or that you should be directed to a central point or a central figure. Leonardo da Vinci uh, is is one who is important for having developed what is known as the Renaissance Pyramid. This is a pyramid of figures in which occupies the central space of a painting. We see this in his Madonna of the Rocks and his Madonna and Child with Saint Anne, and this will later get employed in some things like the Donitondo by, by Michelangelo, where the figures if you were to attach them to a geometrical shape, would form a pyramid which gives further depth to them instead of stacking them or what you would call triangular composition, where, where they don't actually um, encompass three-dimensional form. Raphael, too, will do this in his Madonna of the Meadows. I do recommend you seek out these images and look at what I mean by pyramid composition. It's a lot harder to explain without visual reference. I like to talk about Leonardo da Vinci because he was so important in defining the standard, uh, a standard of Renaissance painting. Like I said, it, it, you can't pin every rule down to every painter and every painting can be analyzed in its own way, but da Vinci was concerned with real anatomy, naturalistic anatomy, botany, depicting plants as they were, not generically putting greenery or some kind of tree. He was specific in what types of plants appeared in his, in his works. He was specific in any sense of, uh, of, of realistic facial expression and detail to figures and drapery studies. Uh, he, he he didn't really even fancy himself much of a painter, more, more so an inventor, which is a, a complete different tale of its own. Um, Botticelli does this too with plants in his Primavera, which is an ess essential work that you guys have to look at and, and understand that every one of the plants at the feet of Venus, or Virgin Mary, however you want to talk about her, um, are identifiable plants. Da Vinci observed the atmosphere and tried to employ naturalistic atmosphere in his paintings and painters after him would follow that example as well. And this is a, an adequate segue, I would say, into this essential bit of scholarship by Professor Marcia B. Hall, who writes and publishes on the Italian Renaissance and Renaissance art and visual culture, um, where she talks about the four modes of Renaissance painting. And I want to go over these briefly, and I want to start with the sfumato of Leonardo da Vinci. Sfumato literally means smoked or blurred. And one of the things that Leonardo da Vinci observed was that in real life, you do not see things in lines. And his idea was to blur the edges of his paintings, of his figures, of his composition, in order to render a painting more like the natural world, more like reality. And because he predominantly did use oil painting, not exclusively, but he was able to use his finger to actually blur the lines of a painting. If you look at his Gioconda, Mona Lisa, right, you'll see that she is 
smoky, blurred, because that is how he managed to create his a his own specific aesthetic, even though that that transitions into other paintings afterward, right? But to actually get rid of the lines, and that is in direct contrast to line-based painting that you'll see with with artists like Ghirlandaio that will specifically put in a line and outline their figures. And they're going to do this on purpose, of course. Artists at the time that would have been familiar with, with what da Vinci was doing might say, no, we need lines, and specifically take that route, um, like Botticelli would, like Michelangelo would, and um, Raphael will do a little bit of all of it, okay? So the first, well, one, one of the four modes by uh, Marcia B. Hall is the sfumato pioneered by Leonardo da Vinci. The predecessor of this is the chiaroscuro. We talked about chiaroscuro a little bit in the first episode. That is what Giotto began with. That is light and shade. That's using a light source to render your figures naturalistic and with depth by creating areas of highlight and shadow. This is important for all the modes after it, but chiaroscuro is a trademark mode of Italian Renaissance painting and a very important vocabulary word for students of art history, and it's something that is not going to ever go away. We still use chiaroscuro in realistic depiction today. Light and shade and shadow are a necessity for rendering a naturalistic image. Next is the cangiante mode, cangiante, and what this does, now this is also something that Giotto started, but is most notably on the Sistine ceiling painted by Michelangelo. This is the use of very vibrant, bold color, and using a darker form of a color in order to render its shadow, and what this, what this makes is bold, sharp contrast, putting instead of your standard chiaroscuro, which slowly transitions your, your light and shadow, there are two colors set up against each other. An example that, that, I, that is the easiest to, to explain is if he's using a yellow orange, a yellow or an orange on his Cumaean Sibyl, then the shadow may be a dark, bold red. Okay, ideally it sounds like it's, it would look like a coloring book, but for those of you who have seen images of the Sistine ceiling, you know that that is not the case. I want to stress that by the time we arrive at Michelangelo in Rome, we have transitioned into the Cinquecento in what is known as the High Renaissance. So he's taking a Trecento mode of painting of Giotto, employing it and reimagining it in the Cinquecento for a new style of painting that will eventually become something, uh, an abstract sort of art movement known as mannerism, but that is not our conversation today. And now I don't mean abstract as in the modern term abstract. It is a move away from naturalism and more into a perceived idealism. Michelangelo's Cangiante in contrast to Giotto's, in contrast to the sfumato, in contrast to your standard chiaroscuro, is not naturalistic. It is bold, it is idealistic, it creates dynamic images that can't be those colors, right? It's only when Raphael comes along that the fourth mode, unione, union, unity, uh, brings together the different types of bold outlines, the blurry edges of sfumato, the delicate rendering of chiaroscuro, and it creates a pictorial composition of color that is unified and visually, how do you say it? Um, not plain, but somber. Raphael's School of Athens in the Stanza della Segnatura in the Vatican City is considered to be one of the most perfect examples, and I say that kind of with, you know, air quotes, of a high Italian Renaissance art. You have 
accurately depicted forms on a fresco that uses unione, neither bold outline nor overly excessive blurred edges with delicate renderings and shadow, okay, that features the ideas of the Renaissance, the debate between Plato and Aristotle, the soul versus the mind, and it features a great number of the known philosophers from antiquity, and both in subject matter, in color, and in composition, please feast your eyes upon the School of Athens and spend some time looking at this painting and getting familiar with its visual capacity to demonstrate all of the ideals of Italian Renaissance painting that we've discussed today. It is an outstanding example. And lastly, I'd just like to briefly review everything we discussed here for the, for the kids in the back with their headphones on, not paying too much attention, okay? So we have a Italy that is a combination of city-states run by the guilds, the arti, who commission paintings, more or less, to the standards of a very specific contract. You, we have developments in painting in terms of style and composition. Leon Battista Alberti, very important, molto importante, introduces linear perspective. Almost every painter is going to use this from that point forward. So now you have paintings that are rendered in naturalistic, realistic ways with believable perspective, which are optically compensated. And according to Marcia B. Hall, are um, going to be colored in one of four modes. Chiaro scuro, light and shadow. Sfumato, smoky, blurredness. Cangiante, uh, contrasting, uh, direct color. And unione, by the time of the High Renaissance, which is going to unify all of the different modes and ways of pictorial representation of color. Thank you all so much for tuning in and listening. Next time, we're, we're hoping to start to develop ideas about fundamentals of sculpture or architecture, or maybe we'll do both. I haven't decided yet, to be clear. Additionally, though, I have reached out to some brilliant scholars who are willing to sit in and talk with me um, about their specific areas of expertise in this field so that we can we can deep dive more instead of looking at, at, at the fundamentals, though I think the fundamentals are absolutely necessary before we deep dive. So stay tuned. Thanks for listening. Give me a rating, like and share, and buona giornata.